Welcome to Vision Chat, where the only thing that matters is the future. I'm Farouk Day, Vice Provost at Johns Hopkins University, and it is my pleasure to be here today with three colleagues and friends and leaders and visionaries. Michelle Weiss, who is doing a residency as in, at Imaginable Futures. Uh, she's also author of the new uh, book, Lifelong Learning, Go Get It Today. Um, Addie Schwartz, who is the founder and CEO of Reach Higher, and uh, Jeremy Padani, who is the uh, founder and CEO of the Career Leadership Collective. Thank you all so much for being here with me today. It's gonna be a lot of fun to talk about skills of the future. Um, so um, Michelle, Addy, uh, Jeremy, uh, we've been living in this transformation for the last six months, um, uh, or probably more now, probably like more like eight months uh, as a result of COVID-19 and the world is changing right before our eyes. Um, but the conversation around the future of work and how skills are changing is not new. I think perhaps it's just being uh, going through an acceleration right now. And most recently, the World Economic Forum published a new report um, that shared that 50% of employees need reskilling by 2025, and 40% of employees will require reskilling of six months or less. Uh, we're seeing a lot of new trends and new types of skills that are emerging. Um, and what I often say to people is just sit down and pause and, and watch what's been happening around you how education is happening in your household, how work is happening in your household, how shopping, how transportation, how it's all shifting really quickly. And that should tell you all you need to know about how the world of work is changing and the skills that are required for the future. So there's a lot happening. Let's try to unpack it a little bit today. Michelle, what are you seeing from the things that you're reading and the things that you're uh, researching? Yeah, thanks Thanks so much, Farouk, and hi, everyone. Um, I, I think what's fascinating, right, as you think about just that the the statistic you quoted from the World Economic Forum is, yes, it's clear that we need reskilling. There's a huge swath of our population who, you know, got furloughed, lost their jobs in, in industries that were decimated. But the, the one challenge, and, and that report also underscores it, is that employers and job seekers just have no way of sort of evaluating or what they call invoicing their own talent, right, and the capabilities in their workforce. And I think this is what, what to me kind of comes out of all of this sort of panic around the coronavirus and the skills needed for now and for the future is we just haven't ever historically been great at helping people pivot you know, from job to job or from industry to in industry, I almost feel like it's, it's almost like a mythical something, right, where <laughs> we, 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 we want to believe in the ability to pivot and, and switch and, and make career changes, but it's inordinately difficult because we always ask people for the precise work experience or the job experience in order to give them the chance. And so for people now who are in industries where they can't actually return to them, it's even more critical that people understand which skills are actually portable and which skills they actually have to augment or develop. And we have no great assessments or easily accessible ways for any job seeker on the street to just be able to say, okay, I'm gonna go in and analyze the gaps that I have, right? I, I'm gonna sort of surface all of my hidden skills and my explicit skills and my formal credentials and my informal credentials and my job experience, we have no way of just sort of saying like, here's who I am today relative to where we want to go. So I feel like that's, to me, that's just sort of like, it, it just exposes this almost big lie of, of pivots that we've never been able to facilitate in the workforce. I'd like to jump in and talk a little bit about pivoting because I feel that that is the future and the skills that are needed for, uh, you know, five years from now and in 2030 uh, are, t are similar, but yet the jobs that people are taking are different. So if you absolutely like boil it down to what are the core skills like critical thinking and logic and you know these core skills and then are able to pivot people to do new jobs and in new industries, that's what it takes. But you know, here we have technology that's an enabler, but also, um, kind of a, a stop, you know, it, it stops things. So talent acquisition, uh, you know, programs that 
companies use, um, do everything to throw people out, as you're saying, Michelle. And pivoting, I think, is essential. Um, you know, through the work that we've been doing by putting women back into the workforce for almost a decade, we've had to pivot because, you know, there are jobs like, you know, a cloud consultant. 10 years ago, there wasn't even the job cloud consultant because there wasn't cloud. So, you know, to be able to take core skills, layer on new skills, and then pivot people into new industries, to me, that's what it takes. But by the way, that's harder to do when you're doing it all with technology. You need a human connection in order to do that. And you need foresight and companies that think more openly about talent and about possibility. And one thing that we have seen is that by creating, you know, what we have as a six month on ramp for folks where, you know, it's just as much up to the individual to decide if they want the company as it is the company to decide if it's a good fit for the individual. It offers people the opportunity to try things on that they wouldn't otherwise do. And I feel like that is the future. The mindset has to be changed and we need to be able to pivot people. And we do it every day, um, but it has to be done at scale. Don't you think that the pivot has a a, a long arc to it because we're, we're pivoting in the midst of a paradigm shift and a global pandemic and broad racial injustices everywhere. And so it's, it's like, it's super messy right now that this big pivot that's going on. There's, I, f- I feel like it's, uh, you know, you can talk to people about upskilling, you can talk to them about reskilling and you could, you know, get, get real surgical on skills. But when it's happening, when companies are pivoting to not even know some of the skills that they need and, uh, talent is having to pivot, whether you're employed or just starting out in the workforce. So it's it's a really messy equation in comparison to the past, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. I think it's messy, but on the other hand, I think it also creates opportunity because people that were, you know, uh, you know, restaurant workers, they could maybe be customer service reps. Um, you know, you just have to think differently and you have to also allow people themselves to not box themselves in and be so narrow in the way they view their own jobs and their own roles and their own strengths. Yeah, I actually um, wrote a, a short piece on this. Um, and because we have now access to so much big data, it's not the silver bullet. And I'm not arguing that we should always just kind of be, kind of be looking at like job postings data or um, social profile and resume data. But when you actually marry the two, you can do some really cool work. And especially when it comes to thinking about the transitions for retail, hospitality, transportation workers who kind of lost their jobs in the midst of this current moment, you can actually see if you look at kind of um, the past 10 years and the kinds of transitions people have made, Uh, you can actually start to identify some of the granular skills that if you actually add on a couple of these competencies, you can actually open yourselves up to much more actually promising opportunities in PR or finance. And and the strange thing is it kind of goes against your natural thinking of normally when you look at something like retail, a lot of people do tend to stay in retail. But when you look at some of those more kind of idiosyncratic pathways where people are actually moving into finance or moving into human resources, and you actually start to look at those thousands or hundreds or 20 data points, you can actually start to see like, oh, if you just add on some onboarding or talent sourcing or payroll and benefits administration, you can make this huge leap. But again, this is like researchers and analysts like looking at this data, but most people have no access to this, right? And so Addy, I'm wondering like, as you're dealing with the women returning is it really like the human touch point of like trying to surface those competencies for them? I'm just, it's, it's hard to do this. It is, but, but you need the job, you need the opportunity, and then you need the applicant that you ha- is open-minded. So I'll give you two examples. Um, one is somebody who was out of the workforce two years, had a major tragic car accident, lost her significant other and was left with a, you know, a a small child and was doing pharmaceutical sales. Um, She ended up having to sort of upend everything, pushed out of the workforce for two years. Two years isn't that long of a time. Suddenly she couldn't get back. She couldn't get back under any scenario and she needed the job. I mean, people need to work, right? To pay their bills. And so she came, she came, 
serendipity through us. <laughs> serendipity is a big word I'm going to talk about today. And, uh, and we, we took her from pharmaceutical sales into talent acquisition in a financial services company. Okay. How do you do that? You do that because you're looking at the whole person. You're looking at their skills and their, and then are able to transform them into a different role. But you also need to have an employer that's open-minded to take the chance. I'll give you one other example, Chris, okay? 18 year career break, um, worked at United Airlines, okay? Had a sick child, that's why she had a, a career break of 18 years, significantly disabled child. Tried to get back, we put her in a medical device company. That medical device company didn't exist probably 20 years ago when she was like building her career. How do you do it? You do it with the human touch. You do it not through applicant tracking system. You do it through creating on-ramps and bridges. And I wrote an article actually uh, recently, I'll post it in the um, chat, uh, you know, all about building bridges. I think that we as a society need to build bridges. And this idea of the corporate ladder just needs to be blown away because you know everything is narrow everything is linear you have to fill this job and there's on top of it all layering you know with gender which is what i've been focused on women don't apply to jobs they don't think they're able to get you know and they don't have all of the boxes checked so being narrow minded on what your skills are whether you're in college whether you're you know um, midway through your career you know we need to be able to take people that have been in one industry, move them to another. That breeds innovation. That creates connectivity in different ways. Sorry. So, I, I think that what this makes me think of is uh, the uh, timeline and what is required that need uh, to uh, for anyone to reskill uh, or to even just develop skills. And it's making me think of the role of higher education too. Um, will the model of four years education uh, for undergraduate, two years for master's, whatever, um, um, will that still work? I mean, I don't know, Jeremy, you're, you're playing a lot, of, you're doing a lot of things in, the, in that world. What are, you, what are you seeing in higher education in colleges and universities? And are there shifts that we have to make in order to catch up um, with uh, the skill demands uh, of the future? Yeah, absolutely. And I actually really love it, Addie's comments about the corporate ladder. Uh, so we launched the National Alumni Career Mobility Survey two years ago. And one of the things we wanted to build into that is it's a survey for colleges and universities about the uh, career mobility of their graduates in the first 10 years. And we define career mobility based on three things. It's not corporate ladder. It's actually uh, preparation. So pathway preparation, career satisfaction, and economic satisfaction. And we combine, there's about 15 variables under each of those three things. And one of the things we did is we uh, built into the survey uh, kind of a, a synthesis of three uh, common data sets of skills. So we took the World Economic Forum data, the NACE uh, competency data, and the Heart Research AAC and U data and mashed them together and came up with 14 skills, competencies. And we're able to look at what did they learn during the course of their education that would help them toward career mobility in the future. And it's really interesting to look at the alumni lens on what they say are the most important skills for career mobility, not just on what the employers may want in their first job. And so what we saw was the most learned skills while they were at their institution were really common. They're kind of in line with the, the things that you'd see uh, at NACE. So they're critical thinking, teamwork, oral written communication. But when, when you look at uh, the, the skills of the, the top 25th percentile of those that are most career mobile, they were totally different. It was ability to manage your career, leadership, and work ethic. Those were the top three that stood out as, as influence, influential. So uh, we can't, I, I think we need to take the multiple dimensions of skill sets and say, what could universities look at? Are they just looking at what might help with the first job? Are they looking at what might help with uh, career, social mobility, uh, and, and how, do we, how do we do that from an equitable per perspective? So I, I think there's a lot of dimensions to it that uh, universities are right now exploring pretty full on. The, so um, uh, what, what, what that makes me think of, and there's a question uh, about certification here, is what are, are certifications necessary and, where, and, and are there other avenues that one would get? And I've, I've been especially recently of the opinion that, but I'll be interested in seeing what 
industry requires. Um, I've been in the, that credentialing, perhaps we're going to get to a point where it's not that that important. Uh, credentialing as in like it's full package degrees or big credentials, maybe like micro credentials, things that just show that you have taken this course or that course that gets you the skill that is necessary for that job. So I'm wondering if that that's where we're going to uh, to land uh, uh, eventually. Um what I tell people, I mean, I just had this question from somebody recently who asked me uh, whether or not they should get an MBA. My first answer is, why do you want to get an MBA? And what skills are you trying to get from it? And what do you think it'll open for you? And um, uh, if, if it's about skills, you can go and take the same courses for a lot cheaper on LinkedIn Learning or Coursera or whatever, you know, just at any of these online tools, you can go get some experience, read books, things like that. But if you're looking for the credential, be sure that whatever job that you're trying to attain it really wants that degree of an MBA. Does it, that, does it really require it? But if it's for skills, you can get it in a different way. You know, Farouk, um, but that's a dangerous thing because then people are starting to think about, do they need a four-year college degree? And, you know, we've seen a lot of people in the tech space that go to these coding schools and get a degree for a lot less, less money than going to four years of college. And now with the pandemic, where you're not getting all the extracurricular experience, you know, you have to think about, you know, where is that going to get me and the debt that I'm going to assume, you know, does that get me where I need to go? I think that question about credentials and credentialing and certificates is really interesting because I'm seeing lots of companies out there suddenly that are, hey, do you have something that we can credential (laughs) and give a micro certificate to your people that went to a two-day two-day conference? You can get a certificate and put it right on your LinkedIn profile. So I could see that there's this plethora of certificate getting. And then and then what does that all mean? So I do think there's going to come something where, you know, uh, how do you weigh it all, you know, and what does it all mean and getting, you know, a hundred certificates, how does that translate into getting the job versus, you know, you know, higher learning. So. Yeah. I feel like this question of credentials, there's sort of a limit to how much we can actually depend on credentials. And I feel like we've kind of already hit that extreme because we've constantly been up credentialing, right. We've been kind of, asking for higher degrees for jobs that don't require that degree in the first place, because we're realizing that this sorting mechanism of, of a bachelor's degree is just not helpful in identifying talent. So we've gone really big and now it's master's degrees or even more advanced degrees. But then there's this other dimension of it where, okay, that's not working. So how do we get more specific and how do we understand like what these skills really are, what they translate into? And as we think about career mobility for, for graduates, especially, um, it's really important to, to be able to break down these really broad, I'm just going to call them human skills. There's lots of different names for them, right? Like these workforce competencies, these different kinds of non-cognitive soft skills or core skills, um, but they're human, right? And this is something also that the World Economic Forum has underscored about the future is the way in which we're going to be competitive in the future is the way we amplify or, you know, what robots and machines can't do. But it's not enough for us to just be saying, I'm great at communication and ethics and problem solving or synthesis. Um, it is about sort of identifying the trajectories of graduates and saying, okay, even these liberal arts graduates who have these more broad-based degrees are making it into finance and articulating these problem solving competencies by saying that they can do strategic planning or forecasting. And when they move into HR, you know, they're doing change management and succession planning. There's different names for them, right? And and it's a matter of also facilitating that translation process, because unless we actually start all speaking the same language, we're just, we're just going to continue to have this friction. And we're always going to be looking for a different kind of proxy for talent. And I think it's really interesting how the World Economic Forum, to your point, Michelle, they combine, I think their top skill was analytical thinking and innovation. They combined mm-hmm. innovation with analytical thinking. And I think that's really fascinating to me. They also combine social influence with leadership, mm-hmm. uh, which I think is very new and very, very edgy. Yeah, it's like these hybrid skills. It's not, you can't just be sort of like a generalist. It's, it's that human and the technical skills. It's always these 
things that, that don't fit neatly into a bucket. And so how do you actually articulate those? And, and for the first time, they've added the self-management category, which I think you alluded to earlier, Jeremy, um, um, you know, which have to do with um, um, active learning and learning strategies, resilience, stress tolerance, flexibility. It's just sort of like the call to this agility um, uh, characteristic or trait for, uh, for the employees of the future, because it's not going to be a straight line. And how are you going to manage your own? Uh, psychology and your own uh, uh, your, your own self in this new environment. I, I haven't seen that before. That's a new category that they've added. It, so it, it, it's fascinating. Um, so there is a question here uh, that I really like about uh, uh, tech companies that are promoting their own certificate courses. And I have an opinion about that. I think I've, I've had it for a while now, which I I think it's the gap between industry and higher education that's pushing companies, and it's the big ones that are able to do this, to create this, to create basically their own u internal universities. Um, and it came out of frustration from universities not listening. And I know I'm being a little bit critical here of my own industry. There are now examples of more and more universities that are listening and that are creating partnerships, to be fair. Uh, but overall, as an industry, we haven't listened. We've resisted industries uh, and uh, our corporate partners. Uh, so therefore, they, you know, when we send them our graduates, they tell us they're lacking skills in certain areas. And we have to somehow just develop those skills. So now they've created their own internal boot camps, if you will, um, that are uh, doing this. And I think we're going to see this more uh, as we move into the future. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I think, I, think, I, I, I think it works really well for IT fields right now because you can kind of prove what you know. And it's this idea of being able to prove what you know that I think there will be other models for fields that aren't quite as open to, you know, hiring someone with just a certification as opposed to a college degree. Um, the exciting thing is the way in which different kinds of on-ramp programs are playing around with apprenticeships. I think when you actually offer a way for an employer to try out talent before they decide to buy that talent or hire that talent, right? There are these really interesting kind of try before you buy outsourced apprenticeship models, you know, that places like uh, Kenzie Academy and Launch Code and, you know, other sorts of on-ramps are trying. And I think that that's the way to kind of mitigate risk for the employer is, is, is the employer needs to just be able to know that the person has the skills. It's harder with some of the fuzzier fields, but I think there are ways of getting around it through, through work-based learning opportunities. And I want to just build on that because that's what we do every day. So we do a six month program. We bring women in and we actually do men too now. Uh, so we bring people in and we offer them this six month opportunity where they get paid, where they get reskilled. Um, so their skills are being built and they're in a real job for six months. Uh, I think it is more of a, um, you know, work assignment as opposed to a uh, apprenticeship. Apprenticeship sometimes has this feeling that you're not getting paid. And even an internship is kind of a time bound thing. What, what's great about this, and often people call it a returnship, um, but it offers the employer this chance to try somebody, put them in a new industry, um, and not have any worry that if it doesn't work out, it's a program. It has a beginning, a middle, and an end. You're offering new skills. You're offering an opportunity. And by the way, it's a great opportunity to build diversity in your organization uh, because you know, somebody who may not on paper have the skills that would qualify them for that opportunity gives them the chance to learn it on the job. And I feel that is why um, universities need to do more of this experiential learning and embrace it and make that part of their overall their overall learning experience, you know? So the um, experiential learning and on top of layered into traditional um, educational uh, modules and framework is key. And, you know, that's what I firmly believe, um, whether you're, you know, in high school, in college, you need to try things on, you need to create your own future, you need to 
what high school kids knows exactly what they want to do. What college kids, most college kids going into college, they don't know what, what they should do or what they want for their career. Maybe there are a few passionate people, but, you know, who absolutely have known that they want to be a doctor from the age of six, but most people don't, and they need to find their future. And we need to offer them the opportunity to find their future. I think that's right. Cause if we, I, I think it's really, really important comment you made about more holistic experiential learning being embedded. I think it be, can be done in a number of ways. One, one of the, and to Farouk's point about pushback, you know, universities do push back on listening to employers a lot. And I sometimes rightly so if it, if the, the messages that they're getting are just isolate everything down to these three skills or something. But when, when it's phrased more broadly that the, the, these new skills of the future can happen in the context of experiential learning, I think it's very powerful. And uh, some, of, some of the data that we came out of our, our, uh, our high impact career mobility campus um, uh, annual report was, was that there, there are four big significant factors that relate to career mobility over, over the arc of the first 10 years. And, Two of the big ones were right in line with what you just said, Addy. One, one, one of them is if if their camp, if their institution allowed them to interact with employers during the context of their education, that like, this is a big deal. Uh, the second is if they had uh, an experiential learning, if they had a career experience, experiential learning experience uh, that was related to their career. There were kind of three levels of the experience. Uh, career experiences or internships. Um, one was if you just had one, it was good. It uh, stepped up in in significance if it was related to your major and it stepped up even higher if it ended up being related to your career. So you can see a lot of the nuances of experiential learning there. But I think I think there's more, uh, there, the project-based learning environment is really growing right now. And I think that that's the method of, of adoption that will stick more than just uh, isolating skills. And uh, I, th I think faculty are sometimes hesitant to, this is a hot new trend, adapt your curriculum. Uh, but if, but if there's a broader thoughtful play where they, they can Im embed uh, uh, more experiences and project-based learning into their curriculum, I think that's, that's a good thing. Then why is, why is there resistance then? Like it, it, everything you're saying makes a lot of sense, but well, there's still resistance out there. Yeah, I think there, there's may, maybe positive and negative spectrum of resistance there, <laughs> um, and uh, we could get into all of those. But you know, one one might be uh, the slow pace of higher ed curricular changes. Um, so it, you know, a lot of times the, the 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 edgy and innovative changes that are being made are not curricular based; they're actually uh, one off courses or they're instru the instructional based in the classroom. And so, I think uh, and and the rapid pace of change is, is really a challenge for big organizations like universities to some degree. So the, they'll start down the path of changing one course and then making some instructional changes. And then two years in when they can make a curricular change, the trend has changed. <laughs> and so that, that makes them hesitant over time. And, uh, but I actually think there's a newer model that's emerging where faculty departments are structuring to be agile and innovative. It's not a massive percent of, or of universities that are doing this, but when it happens, it's really beautiful. And it's, it's really centered on the student and centered on what, what is important for their immediate future. And so, uh, yeah, it's, it's a pretty big mixed bag from uh, why there's resistance. In my opinion, I think there's probably more dimensions to that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a huge mindset shift, right? As, as much as we like to think in higher ed that we are student-centered, the, the structure of the academy is such that it is actually more faculty-centered, right? They are sort of the locus of control within a university and, and they get to teach what they want to teach, right? And uh, they're worried that they're going to teach things that may become obsolete if they kind of align to workforce needs. But the, the, the challenging balance to, to sort of just to navigate here is that um, it can't just be, but, you know, em employers can't just be saying higher ed, take care of it. Higher ed can't just be saying it's the province of employers uh, because in the middle of this are the job seekers who are really struggling in the labor market. Um, many of them are, you know, we did a study with Burning Glass where 43% of newly minted college grads with bachelor's degrees were starting off underemployed. And if you started off underemployed, you were five times more likely to remain underemployed five and 10 years out. It was scary how persistent the trend could be. So it's, it's 
it's, it's understandable that there are real kind of, you know, there's real inertia in the system, both on the workforce side and on the institutional side. But that doesn't mean we can't just kind of, we, we can just sort of leave it alone. And the other thing I just wanted to add, just because it's a, we've been kind of talking about the traditional system. And as we think about, you know, the way to validate people's experiences better, we also have to think about how we integrate these work-based learning opportunities and hands-on and experiential learning in the workforce. Um, my particular vantage point is always looking at kind of adults age 25 and up who supposedly have to kind of reskill and retool themselves, but where are the opportunities to do it? You know, the biggest constraint that most people have is that resource of time and no one in the employer system, despite these hundred million dollar initiatives out there by major corporations, we're not actually at carving out time for people to skill up. So we're saying, yes, you guys need to skill up. Here's some, you know, tuition reimbursement dollars or some opportunities over here, but you got to do it on your own. All of the onus is on the individual. And so it's, it's again, like who's going to take some responsibility Everyone needs to, it can't just always be on the job seeker to kind of fumble around, to figure out what skills they need to do it, you know, to acquire those skills on their own. Um, that's what really kind of worries me as we think about, you know, this, this kind of longer work life that we have ahead of ourselves. I, I, have, I have one thought, uh, Michelle, building on what you said, you know, just thinking about what is the uh, ROI on, you know, traditional education and, you know, given the pandemic and so many folks being derailed uh, from, uh, you know, being at their at their universities and going through their four years of experience or six years of experience, um, you know, that the issue really is um, what is the ROI and is there going to be more pressure placed on uh, universities thinking about, you know, and, and students, potential students thinking about what is the ROI for making this investment. Now, I am a true believer in, I was a, you know, an English major and I'm so proud of being an English major. So I love that I was a humanities person, uh, but you know, people are gonna begin to think about if I'm not getting the experience and it costs this much money and I have this much debt, how does it all, how does it all translate? So I think that, that, that may put pressure on, you know, uh, the academic world that is trying to sort of teach to what they want to teach and not having the openness to think about the rest of the world and how that person or those students are going to end up in that world and what that's all going to mean. Totally. I mean, we got three English majors on this call, except for Farouk. Farouk was a finance <laughs> I, I major. somehow was misguided. <laughs> Well, I mean, if you think about it, right, Jeremy and Addie, like if, if we if we were to have to map this out on the front end, it would be really hard to kind of say, like, this is what we're going to do with this English major. It was not clear how you actually translate these skills into the labor market. Right. But we've we've navigated, you know, successfully. But how do we make it so that more learners can launch a little more smoothly without all of that kind of grasping and fumbling? Well, I think Northeastern, who's been at it 100 yep. years, who's in my neck of the woods, because I live in outside of the Boston area, they've kind of gotten it down, which is, you know, really embed experiential learning into the educational experience. Now, that has a whole lot of other things to it, including like, I don't think they have a graduation, because everybody's graduating at different times, doing different things and on their own plan. Uh, which is kind of sad, right? You'd want to go through experience and then go through graduation and have alumni and, um, and reunions and things. But yeah, uh, the cool thing is, is that those students do graduate with a lot of experiences. They try a lot of things on and those employers, which is another talent acquisition strategy, uh, get to some of those kids early enough, find them, like them, keep offering them to come back. And then where do they end up going when they graduate to those uh, companies where they already know the culture, they already know the business and they can add value. So that's actually pretty interesting. And I know it's not a new idea, but you know, not every organization, not every university is embracing that to that degree. Right, Farouk? <laughs> right. And I think what concerns me about all of this, all of the conversations we're, we're having now, uh, what you just shared, uh, uh, Addy, uh, Michelle, what you said earlier about the onus on the individual to go and figure it out, 
Um, he said, you're going to end up with people figuring that out and others who don't. And typically those who don't are the least privileged ones, the ones that don't seem to, 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 to have the networks uh, or the support or have learned from a young age how to navigate complex systems to try to get to that. So to find themselves in that pipeline, I mean, I, wor I really worry about students, the, about any system where you have students identified so early by employers, like you just shared, Addy. I mean, I, I like that for those students, but I worry about the ones who don't get found. And um, uh, there is a risk there that you end up having um, an equity issue. Um, and I think that that's why we have to be more proactive in educational settings, whether that's universities, colleges, boot camps, or whatever. We have to be proactive and just say that we, that we, we can't put it the onus on the individual all the time, mm -hmm. which has been, I think, the acad academia's argument for a long time is that, you know, we're here to teach you and then you go figure it out. We can't, we can't create the roadmap for you. Um, well, that's, uh, that's assuming that everybody comes from a similar background and they know how to navigate this thing or, or they have so, so certain access on their own. That is no longer the university of today, for example, you know. But, but um, I do so think, Farouk, though, I do think, though, a place like Northeastern that, you know, if you're able to get yourself to a university that offers those bridges, that that it offers bridges to people that are, you know, first generation, low income students, because those opportunities are open to all those students. And that could be a differentiator. I know that people go to that school because they know that they have more access to exploring different kinds of things and that they are getting that experiential learning. So it becomes a differentiator. And that could be something that un universities decide to make a critical strategy that they are better integrating the world of work and education in ways that Precisely. allow people to find their careers. Right, because, because there is a difference between uh, uh, these opportunities are open to anyone and um, this is what you will go through in order to be not only graduate, but also to, to, to be successful. So we're going to embed it into your learning experience. You don't have to go on a scavenger hunt in your uh, reskilling or skilling or learning journey to try to figure this out, you know, because everybody's paying the same price ticket, the admissions ticket at the beginning. It doesn't matter where it's coming from, scholarship or their parents' pocketbook, but it's, the, everybody's saying they're paying the same. Why is it that some make it after graduation and others just get jobs barely? And I think that's I think the the the, the issue that we have to uh, to to look into. Um, and I know we have all these surveys that are showing these things. Yeah, it's spot spot on. I, I think that 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 specific difference between just offering something and embedding it as a as a required experience is crucial for equity. I mean, when we mm -hmm. look at like even even alumni would, that look back, we look at the data on those that even received helpful career advice. Sixty percent overall, um, uh, fifty-three percent of first-generation students, forty-seven percent of Hispanic Latinx students, and you can keep going down the list of uh, for forty percent of non-traditional students that received helpful career advice during their undergraduate experience. So that's primarily coming from a system where career development is only offered. Um, experiential learning is only offered. So when we can get to the point of saying this, this is embedded, I think that is, that is, that is crucial. It has to be embedded. And I think the other thing we're learning is that it has to be embedded and there has to be an increased acumen among faculty and staff at the institution about multicultural competency, about um, intercultural career development issues on a base level. Um, so it, it, there could still be equity issues uh, if it's embedded, but there's not a, a, a base level of, of acumen. I think if you look back to like uh, turn of the century, 2000, 2001, there was a, a pretty big push for multicultural competency, knowledge, awareness, skills among uh, faculty and staff at the university to say we, we, we um, in order to do business in the university society, you have to have a base level multicultural competency. I think what's coming out right now, and I'd love to see, that that big push be, there has to be a base level of career competency combined with that multicultural competency that every faculty and staff are expected to have because career conversations are happening everywhere on the college campus. They're very broad with biology professors, with basketball coaches everywhere. 
today, every, every day. <laughs> and so, but what, what's happening is how can we raise the level of quality in those conversations? How can we raise the level of equity in those conversations so that uh, when it's happening everywhere or when it's embedded, there's actually decent quality and equitable services. I do, I do want to give a, a shout out to uh, the University of Cincinnati, just because Northeastern gets a lot of, of the credit for co-op programs, but University of Cincinnati is an enormous embedded program um, and does and really gets at this issue of equity um, when it comes to thinking about experiential learning. Um, the, thing, the thing I think that's your question, Farouk, is, is, is indirectly touching or directly touching is this idea of social capital too, right? Like, how when when we think about who's who's being left out of this equation and who's who's getting kind of access or a fair shot in the hiring process so much of it depends on social capital right and there and the neat thing is that there are there are really cool startups that are now trying to build social capital more deliberately because it's kind of implicit in wealthier students where they just have access to their parents networks um, but you have places like Climb Higher, where Nitsan Palman, the, the founder, started it once she realized that most people are nine times more likely to get a job. This is based on LinkedIn data. You're nine times more likely to get a job through a referral um, if you have a referral, right? And that depends on the networks that you have. And so they're trying to be very explicit about building this kind of um, pay it forward model where once people get a job, their participants are required to get more, like to refer more of the students, the participants into the jobs that are available at the company, because this is how we all get jobs. This is how, you know, with, through connections, through relationships. Um, Project Basta, Sheila Sarem is teaching learners how to identify the skills that they have so that, and then build that kind of social capital in these cohorts um, and translate their skills into the labor market. So I think they're really exciting seeds of innovation out there, but we have to be a whole lot more deliberate if we want to get at this equity issue and, and, um, and empower more learners. It has to be about helping them develop those relationships as well. Um, Michelle, just to build on what you're saying, um, Farouk and I um, built something called Beam Fellows at Stanford for the very reason that we felt that, you know, first generation low income students did not have access or connections or network in order to get those jobs and those experiences that could propel them forward. And, uh, you know, that, that I have felt always to be a critical piece of, you know, uh, learning more and, and starting yourself out on a journey that will make it so that you know where you want to take your career and, and build in it. But it takes, you know, university sponsorship and it takes the ability to fund it in a way that if somebody identifies an opportunity that isn't funded or isn't funded to the level that they need, that they're able to provide that or get that money so they actually can explore that opportunity. I think yeah. the University of Chicago does a really good job on this too. Um, and they have a fully funded uh, program and have been doing it since 1996. So, um, but the Beam Fellows program was designed specifically for um, both uh, first uh, first generation low income kids as well as freshmen and sophomores that were undeclared that were not techies, okay, at Stanford. Because, you know, if you're tech at Stanford, that's one thing. But if you are an English major or thinking that you wanna be something other in the humanities, it's harder, it's a harder road. And it's a harder road to visualize what you're gonna do with that degree when you graduate. So being able to, you know, visualize get an experience in an industry that can play to those skills um, can be extraordinarily helpful and also um, move your career in a direction that you never had any idea of before. The last thing I'll say about that is I said a little earlier about serendipity. There's a book called Serendipity Mindset uh, that just came out that I just love. And it's the idea that you're creating your own luck in a way that it's, yes, yeah, serendipity and fate comes into it, but you're also driving your own fate. We need to help students do a better job of driving their own futures by pro providing opportunities, by the way, at every level, both college students, high school students, college students, you know, people mid-career who are coming back, even women, women and men that are reinventing themselves as they go on to their next career, because we're all living so much longer. 
So um, anyway. Thank you for that. And I want, I want to yeah, leverage the conversation about humanities to bring it back to skills. It seems like the humanities might be going through a crisis right now as the world of work is shifting. And uh, maybe it's an identity crisis. Perhaps it's a crisis beyond identity. I'm not sure. You, you'll help me unpack it. Uh, what is the future of humanities um, as we move forward towards the skills of the future and the demands of the world of work? of the employees of the future? I think a, one, one part of it, I, it's, it's, a, it's been a phenomenal question, Farouk. Um, and I, I hesitate to say that I have an answer for it, but I'll, I'll give a, one, one part of this because that's a, that's, a, that's a big topic. And I think something that's gonna be discussed over the next few years um, is if, if there are, referencing back to what we were saying about embedding career development, experiential learning, et cetera. When that starts to happen inside the humanities, that's when I think they, they go out of survival mode and into thriving mode if they're doing it well. A um, couple examples, we, uh, on, on, on the New Forward show, we hosted uh, the uh, Min- University of Minnesota Liberal Arts College, and they have a faculty-led career readiness initiative that has 60, 60 liberal arts faculty involved in it. They've together created eight principles um, to uh, help bolster career education inside the humanities and, and liberal arts. And it's really fantastic. Um, smaller college like Dean College, uh, who's, who's looking at skills and competencies that they need for the future and embedding them, uh, aligning those skills with uh, and aligning different career outcomes with their uh, curricular goals in, inside the academic curriculum. Those, those types of things, when they start to happen like that, where there's this, this synthesis of whether it's career readiness, career development, however you want to call it, concepts into the faculty, empowering the faculty to actually be the ones that do that. I think that will be one dimension that helps with, with reshaping the future. But I, I do think it's complex. I just wanted to show you this data because it is a little bit of a crisis Rook, in terms of the number of people actually moving away from humanities. Um, they're sort of seeing that there's a direct and clear ROI, you know, re- whether that's correct or not, but they're imagining that there is a better ROI by moving into something that's more career oriented, like business, um, healthcare, STEM, um, those sorts of um, opportunities. And um, it's, it's, but it's partly this, this challenge of, it's not that liberal arts majors don't have economic value or, or relevance in the labor market. It's again, how do, you, how do you open yourselves up to more opportunities by also, sometimes it means just kind of getting a minor or an internship in you know, one of like eight areas. This is something that Burning Glass has kind of identified. You know, if you get some graphic design or accounting capabilities, you can really sort of open up the, the kinds of opportunities that, that are available to you. And it was interesting as, as we were all talking about these embedded experiential learning experiences, someone wrote innovation is, is costly. And it is, you know, like for places like Northeastern, they have a machine kind of running their co-op programs, right? And most universities or colleges can't necessarily afford to do to do that kind of work. But again, there's really interesting kinds of seeds of innovation kind of being planted in the margins where groups like Ripen are making it a lot easier in these kind of public private partnerships to build project based experiential um, opportunities for their learners and building in these kind of small co ops. I see that Jeffrey Moss is on. Uh, is in the audience. He works on Parker Dewey doing these kind of micro internship opportunities. There are these kinds of things that exist um, that that universities can turn to if they don't have the means to just kind of reinvent it from scratch. Oh, Farouk, you're muted. Statement, statement of the year, you're muted. It's a statement of the year. It should be added to the dictionary. My apologies. Uh, what you also see, and, and the reason I was muted is because my son is loud on the other room and I didn't want to subject you all to it. So uh, here we are, the challenges of 2020. Um, I, uh, and I had to text him right now and t- tell him to, uh, to <laughs> keep it down. Um, I, uh, the, so you look at liberal arts colleges and, and the things that they have to do um, uh, in order to uh, um, 
get with the program, if you will, to get to, to, to move with the, the transformations of the future. And then you look at also the big, the big um, educational institutions that are emerging out of this, uh, that are focused on skill, that are completely owning it, skill development, that are completely owning it and offering it cheaper and online from anywhere. Uh, you know, you, like University of Maryland Global Campus, Southern New Hampshire University, Arizona State University online programs and on and on. There are all these major universities that are that have created sort of like these um, um, uh, uh, online campuses that are focused on skill there and uh, and um, uh, and are getting a lot of enrollment out of it. So when you think of that, um, you, you, you could see that at least on the higher education side, there is a shift there too. Community colleges also, I think, are playing a major role in the, um, um, in this area. And I think we have we we have no choice but to look at the demands of the workplace. When I was in another panel yesterday with the CEO of um, uh, Lumina Foundation, uh, who said really wisely that technological advances always outpace skills you know so you see first technology you see all these transformations that we have to catch up to try to get our skills to it but at the same time technological advances always create more jobs than they eliminate so we are going to see we're going through the the paradigm shift now but we're going to see a lot more jobs available over the next 10 20 years as a result of the transformations that are happening that have been happening in the last 20 years but especially this year because everything is going so much faster that we have to now start to think about the new skills that we have to, to develop. I'll give you a quick example, and I'd love to also hear how even your own workplaces are changing before your eyes, and maybe the clients that you're working with and the organizations you're working with, how you're seeing them shift. I used to be in the business where I hired a lot of service providers. For the last couple of years, and especially this year, but for the last couple of years, I've been hiring content creators instead um, and moving away from hiring service providers. Service providers, meaning like counselors and advisors and coaches, et cetera. I've been moving more and more towards content creators because that's what I see our audience consume more and at scale and better and have a stronger appreciation for it. It's not the services, it's the content that is provided to, to them um, in digital platforms and, it's, and uh, just in time, whenever, 24 seven. So that's already a shift. The second shift is that I've been hiring a lot more remote employees, you know, people who can work from anywhere. And um, that has made it possible for me not to have to ask for office spaces on my college campus. And, uh, and therefore when I go and ask for budget for new positions, I no longer uh, have to answer the question, where are you gonna put them? <laughs> I, all I need is just a little bit of budget to buy them a computer and a cell phone, and they can literally work from anywhere. And, there, and that has also given me the ability to hire from outside of my town. So I don't have to, to, to uh, and I don't have to relocate them either. So those are two things that are happening now in my world of work that I couldn't have imagined even five years ago or 10 years ago, uh, ago that, that, that it would happen with, with such ease. And, and certainly I, this pandemic has opened the door for that. What's happening in your world of work then? What uh, are you seeing? Well, Farouk, Farouk, I, I wanna just play on your, your point there because you're, not, it, you're seeing it at the university setting, but that's happening worldwide in companies too. And if yep. they're open to hiring from anywhere, that just increases the competitive landscape for getting the jobs, which means more pressure on who are they hiring, what skills do they have, and how are they, you know, fitting into the organization in a way to propel the organization forward. So personally, you know, we hired somebody who lives in San Mateo. <laughs> we hired somebody who lives in London. We hired somebody who lives in Atlanta. Like our workforce suddenly is all over and the pandemic certainly has opened up that aperture even more directly than before. But if you kind of layer that up to major corporations, if they are willing to make it so that they don't have to be in the building, in the location, or even within a 50 mile radius, the world of work has gotten very competitive. Mm -hmm. um, and so we really have to think about what that's gonna do to our inst educational institutions and learning and how we're preparing our students to get those jobs. Yeah, that's a, that's a fair point. It's more competitive. And then, and then now we're starting to think of how do 
employees interview online and how do imp- uh, employees uh, behave online and and how do you create a whole culture and uh, what, you know what are you homesick so it's not I mean, it, maybe that's why the World Economic Forum added that category of self-management because it's not just doing the work and delivering the outcomes. It's also how do you manage your own career and your own self. And we, we onboarded uh, 42 people across four different regions all at the same time virtually with an onboarding that was delivered in the past live, all virtually in one company in the same you know, all at the same time. And then we did the same thing last week for 26 other people in four regions. That's the future. That is the future. It's happening so fast, yes. I even wonder if I can just wonder and not uh, share data that I know about, just think about like maybe riff on what the future could be. Uh, And I think I heard this from somebody the other day that uh, there, there may be campuses that get created where in an amazing place to live where no, the campus is not a college campus. It's a campus to co-locate and you go to school wherever you want to. And the campus simply has basic student affairs staff, et cetera, uh, with that. So I think that when we start to look at what this remote wow. environment, yeah, <laughs> what this remote environment can do is like, okay, I mean, you, saw, you saw the 50 Ivy leaguers uh, doing school online in the fall in Turks and Caicos. Caicos on the islands and in a big mansion that they'd all rented together uh, because they could be there and they could still have social from different schools. Right. So I think there's, there's some, there's some interesting possibilities when you start to. Jeremy, work. I want you to post that. Cause I didn't see it. So post it. I, share. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I see that photo. And I wish I could have been there. Darn. That was a good idea. I, I unfortunately yeah. have to jump off for another call. I really apologize. But I wanted to just sort of say on that last note of, you know, as we think about what remote offers, it, it really can potentially open up and diversify the funnel or the pipeline of talent. Um, you were asking Farouk about like, why is it that some of these mega universities, these online universities are, are getting so much um, attention and, and gaining so much traction? It's because they're performing on a different level of performance than traditional universities. They are making education more flexible, more convenient, right? And, and attending to a more mature learner who's got a lot of other responsibilities. Right. So again, as we think about diversifying, remote really does open up the funnel for more women, for more people of color who cannot move, who have geographical ties and, and different kinds of caregiving obligations. So just wanted to end on that quick note, but I have to jump and I'm so sorry. No problem, Michelle. Thank you for joining us today. I want to also wrap it up with just one final question. One image that describes the future for you. I'd like to go first, Jeremy or Addy. I'm I'm thinking thinking of an image that involves like uh, data being computed because I, 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 I think that a university literally has in their power right now the ability to say, um, hey, hey, uh, Farouk, you graduated in journalism. You didn't graduate journalism. You graduated with a journalism degree and we can see that you didn't take these classes. You're only three years into your career. Would you like to take these classes online with us right now? They have the big data in their hands already to do that. And it changes education to think that they could actually map that to educational outreach for future to assist their alumni base. And I think, so big data is my, uh, I'm, I'm a data nerd and, and I, I love everything big data. And I think it's gonna potentially change things here. I, I'm gonna build on that, Jeremy. I, I'm gonna build on your thought and say that, uh, you know, I view it as, you know, the individual sitting um, somewhere, interacting with other individuals, both virtually and in person. Hopefully it will get back to in person at some point in our lives. And that when new skills are needed, that, you know, as you were saying, like, hey, you need these skills if you want to go in this job. Or you, you know, have you ever thought about taking your skills here and going into that industry? And having the, you know, AI out there to be able to take your skills and map them to different industries and different careers. And also to have it so that um, you're getting the opportunities, irrespective of what background you're from and what, you know, what school you went to or not, to take yourself and propel yourself to a better future. 
Very good. Very good. Those are two powerful examples. Mine is that everybody's walking around with sandals, no, dr no dress shoes, <laughs> because we're all in a Zoom world and we, we don't have to anymore. Um, <laughs> it's been a pleasure having you uh, both, Addie and Jeremy, and my gratitude to uh, Michelle for joining us today. This was a fantastic conversation and uh, vision chat. Uh, remember, everyone, the only vision that matters is the one that you create. Thank you all so much for joining us and see you next time. Thank you, Farouk. Bye now. Bye. Thank you.